Do you often talk about what an amazing life you have? Do you make it clear that you don't need a man to be happy? Are you wary of letting down your guard because you're afraid of getting hurt? If so, this podcast is for you. Stick around. I'm Evan Marquette, dating coach for smart, strong, successful women, and your personal trainer for love. Welcome to the Love You podcast. Stay to the end of this video to learn why it takes confidence to be vulnerable and how the only way to get the love you want is to be vulnerable. When we're done, I'll let you know how you could apply to Love You to create a passionate relationship that makes you feel safe, heard, and understood. So, it's going to be a long one. Strap yourself in. I'm kind of excited for it. So, I'm a dating coach for smart, strong, successful women, have been for 17 years. I don't like to lump everybody together, but there's definitely a certain type of woman who comes to me. You'll see when I launch my new website. It's the woman who has everything but the guy. And if you're the woman who has everything but the guy, that phrase may mean something to you. You are bright, you're accomplished, you look at your life with pride and joy at the things that you've created, the career that you have, your friends, your family, your possessions, your hobbies, your travel. You filled up your life because you're single and you're independent and you have the means and you're driven and that's something to be applauded. No one's suggesting you should sit around waiting for a man. Problem is that when that becomes your whole source of identity, one can become defensive about not having it all. You spend so much time pursuing your work because it's more remunerating that you don't end up getting love. And then the story becomes, I'm happy. I don't need a man to be fulfilled. And that's the face that you put on to the world. And it is a brave face that you put on to the world because you're preparing for the possibility that you might never get a guy. So you better be okay with being alone. And it becomes a bit of a stance. The problem is when that stance shows up in real life and men don't necessarily respond to the woman who doesn't need a man and thinks her life is perfect without one. There's an inherent contradiction in that that's worth exploring. So I'm going to explore it the best way I know how, which is to tell you personal stories. I'll tell you stories about clients too, but I really want to get into the personal aspect of it because I understand this vulnerability confidence piece really, really well. And so I want to bring you back to 15 years ago before I met my wife, uh, I took a class called the Landmark Forum through Landmark Education. Don't want to send you down that rabbit hole, but basically it's a large scale group therapy, really intense three days, right? From eight in the morning to midnight in a room with a bunch of really smart people in the front of the room who are kind of walking you through a group therapy process, getting you to look at yourself, take responsibility for your failures, etc. And a lot of it's really challenging. And I remember being in this course and not being that receptive. I felt like a lot of it didn't apply to me. I felt like I was different than some of the other people there who had bigger problems. My big problem was that I felt lonely and disconnected from my friends and family in my early 30s. So I'm in this class and the professor, teacher, tells me to stand up chooses me, and again, there's 150 people sitting down, he calls on me, and he said, what's what's your deal? You look like you're above it all, is what he says to me. You look like you're above it all. And I said, I, I, I don't mean to sound in a way that I don't wanna sound, but a lot of this stuff, people who have really broken relationships with their family, where they don't, you know, or they were, sexually abused or kicked out of the house or serious drug problems or, you know, really disastrous relationships um, with the most important people in their, their life. I feel like most of that doesn't apply to me. Right. And again, I just, I just, I'll never forget it. He said, and he goes, that's your, that's your problem. And I, I, I'm kind of like cocking my head and he goes, you, carry yourself like a guy who's too good for everything. You carry yourself as I'm smarter than you. My ideas are better than yours. And 
I don't need this. You act like the guy who has it all together. Now, the reason you're here is because you don't have it all together. You might not have the same problems as everybody here, but there's something that's lacking in your life. That's what caused you to reach out. So how can anybody contribute to your life if you are perfect or you put on the, the illusion that you're perfect to the world? That's what you want everybody to see. I have it all together. What does anybody now have to contribute to you? I'm pretty sure I started bawling, right? Because it was so spot on, so close to home, right? I felt disconnected from my friends and family because I was putting on some confident facade, even though I, I'm confident in many ways. I was putting on a facade without any vulnerability, without any humanity. And I was wondering why people weren't responding to me. Right? That. That was really painful to feel shut out because I, I was having trouble making emotional connections with people and I'm an emotional self-aware guy. So they hit on something that I never forgot and that's why I'm sharing it with you today. And so that was an interesting evolution because I've always been the sensitive guy. All right, my mom was always telling me back when I was a, a writer, you, should, you shouldn't be a writer, you should be a psychologist, you should be a shrink, you should talk to people, that's your gift. I remember a story, and I've alluded to it in previous podcasts, but maybe 20 years ago, I had a girlfriend, and on the first date, I remember crying to her. This is how vulnerable I was. I remember telling the story about how my father died. It was like, you know, less than you know, a year later. And I remember telling her the story about how my father died. I was 26, 27 years old. And um, it, the story bring me to tears. And instead of sending her running in the opposite direction, she thought it was beautiful that I could talk about my father in such a loving way and that so many guys don't, right? I didn't like turn on the waterworks to impress her, but I also didn't care that the waterworks were gonna scare her away. I was just being myself and who I was was a guy who was really from his father's death. That did not stop me from hooking up later that night or making this one my girlfriend. That's what I'm talking about, is the confidence to be vulnerable. Again, I'm not recommending crying on dates. We need to understand that. Confident and vulnerable are not mutually exclusive. And a lot of times we make it seem like it is. If I sh let down my guard, if I show someone my humanity, if I show um, any perception of weakness, then I'm feeling, I'm gonna be, I'm desperate. I'm being taken, I'm gonna be taken advantage of. He's gonna run fleeing from my emotions. And these are things that, that women believe. And it's the overcorrection. Are there guys who flee from women's emotions? Sure. Are those the guys that you want? No, period, exclamation point. Think of the best conversations. Think of the conversation I'm having you with you right now. You on the internet, you on the podcast. I am being, again, these are buzzwords, so they almost lack meaning. Authentic, vulnerable, and it takes confidence to put oneself out there and do this. Insecurity is what drives people to be invulnerable. If you're insecure, you're afraid of letting down your guard. If you're insecure, you're afraid of speaking your truth. If you're insecure, you're afraid that everybody's gonna judge you or everybody's gonna leave you. If you're confident, you put it out there and you know that people really respond to confidence, authenticity, vulnerability. I've got a, a, a client, and I remember the story, this years back. She was 60 and she was telling me her story and she was telling me about a source of her dating anxiety is telling someone on a first date that she had um, a child out of wedlock 40 years ago, right? She had, you know, had an accident when she was 20, kept the child. 40 years later, her son is 40 years old. He's a man. And she is still carrying this like it's a badge of shame, like some 60-year-old guy is going to care about something she did 40 years ago and judge her for it. That's fascinating to me that people carry that shame and have trouble reconciling that right? years and years later. I have my own you know, embarrassing stories. I try to tell them publicly as a, as a, as a service to you. Um, my most prominent problem is, you know, I've, I've got a history of anxiety. Um, 
uh, not so much depression, but but definitely anxiety came came on in my late twenties. I almost dropped out of college, and um, then you know surfaced again while I was a screenwriter and had trouble getting it together in my twenties until I kind of figured out my career. And once I had some stability, I landed. But I was really anxious that I didn't know what I was going to do for a living, how I was going to make money, and how I was going to live up to my my potential. And so there was a big source of anxiety for a big for a portion of my life that was debilitating. Um, you know, shrinks, antidepressants, that kind of stuff. Contrary to what you know, what some people might do in that situation, I never really hid from that. I didn't put it in my dating profile. I didn't tell people on the phone, "Hey, yeah, I just dialed down my Zoloft prescription to a half a milligram. Everything's great." Like, it wasn't that. But when you're having a conversation with someone that has any depth or meaning is, and is going there, I don't see any point in hiding from your stuff, right? Where you have to walk it back later. I did a Love You coaching call this week. I love these calls. We really, really go deep. We spend two hours on the phone every week. And sometimes these themes emerge, these unintentional themes. And I had like four or five women ask some version of the same question. When a guy says, um, you know, uh, why are you still single? What do you say? Um, when a guy is asking you about sex, how do you react? When a guy, like, so there's all these questions about, that are almost predictable questions, you know, about your ex, you know, what happened in your relationship or how you enjoy match.com. And, and my clients get this sort of deer in the headlights. I don't know how to answer that. There's absolutely a way to answer that, right? It's, it's the truth. People love the truth. Someone said, you know, if my wife said to me when we were dating, hey, Evan, um, you're a 34 year old dating and relationship coach. You've never had a relationship for more than eight months. What's, how, do you, how do you explain that? I don't like that as a question. It's a little bit too direct and on the spot, but it's a very reasonable point of curiosity. I better have a good answer to that. That's not driven by insecurity or vulnerability. So the best way to answer that is to speak your truth. Well, honestly, I was not in any position to get married in my 20s. I you know, didn't have a career to speak of. Um, I, you know, I was a struggling screenwriter doing odd jobs. I was depressed and anxious. It was a really rough decade. And since I dropped out of film school and wrote a couple books and started to do this you know, dating coaching thing, things have been really good. And you know, since then, I've had much better relationships and getting a lot closer to what I'm looking for. And I've always wanted to fall in love and get married and start a family. And I feel like I've never been in a better place than I am right now. You see that? That's, that's, that's the answer. I didn't have to lie. I didn't have to bullshit. Like, that was the answer. It told the truth. It took ownership. I didn't go down some deep spiral shame, right? Uh, talking about all the mistakes I made in my 20s in life and love and my father dying and and my my terrible screenwriting career and emotionally abusive relationships where I you know got my ass kicked. I didn't have to do all that. Right? So again, I want to bring this back to the original subject. It takes confidence to be vulnerable. It takes confidence to speak your truth and know that your truth is going to be warmly accepted because of your relationship to the story. You could tell it at a remove. You could tell it at a distance without it turning in or blowing up or being held against you in some way. So I really want you to try this idea on for size. Right? The idea that your insecurity around being single, around wanting a man being scared, being hurt, being vulnerable, having made mistakes could actually be a strength. Men would love to hear the truth. They would love to hear you take ownerships. Yeah, I spent, I spent most of my 30s working hard and didn't spend too much time thinking about love. I probably walled myself off from it because I got hurt in my last relationship. And then I kind of, you know, looked up and realized, you know, I, I wanted this whole thing. I wanted to find a relationship and now I'm ready. Like, so much better than, I don't know, I just haven't met the right guy, which is kind of a non-answer. So think in this moment about yourself, how you project to others, the masks you wear, the stories you tell to yourself. I'm fine. I don't need a man. 
the stories that you tell to your friends and men that you meet, the facade that you put up. And ask yourself, how can a man contribute to you? How can he feel connected to you? What is the universal humanity that you show on your dates if you're so busy telling everybody how perfect life is, how perfect you are, how busy and happy you are, how you barely have room to do anything else, how you've never made any mistakes, how you never had any regrets. What can someone grasp onto as human? So the answer to this question is what makes you you and what makes a man fall in love with you is not your impressive job or your education or your cool hobbies. It's your hopes and your dreams and your desires. And yes, even your failures. I'm Evan Mark Katz. Thank you for tuning into the Love You podcast. For more episodes like this on YouTube, click on the subscribe button, ring the bell, and choose all to ensure you get notified whenever new content comes out. And if you're listening to the audio podcast, please scroll down below to leave an honest review on Apple. More reviews equals more awareness of Love, the Love You podcast and more love in the world. And if you're interested in joining Love You, click on the link below to apply. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you soon.